Recently, Xinjiang cotton has got the attention of the world. Western countries, led by the United States of America, are accusing China of forcing labor. They are saying that China is forcing Uyghur Muslims to pick the cotton. And a reasonable person knows that is not true. But what is more ridiculous is that this rumor was started by a few Uyghur activists. One of them is a woman whose name is Yushan Abbas. She's gone so far that she's gone beyond the concept of ridiculousness. You know what she did? She called America her country. Let's take a listen. It was early April 2002. My phone rang. And when I answered, it was... Um, uh, a major from one of the contractors is providing language support for Guantanamo. And then he asked, um, have you heard of Uyghurs being caught in Afghanistan and brought over to Guantanamo? And I said, yes, I need you to go to Guantanamo and translate for those Uyghurs. And I was shocked, actually. I didn't know what to say. But then I decided to go for it. I decided to go and they uh, served my country when the country needed my service. Here, I've got a, a lot of pictures about the bombing of the Middle List by the U.S. and its friends, the Western countries. Let's take a look. See this? This is what your country, America, has done for your people. Look. Hmm? So, see how these people are living? Hmm? See that? Rebels. Hmm? See this? See, what a beautiful woman and what a beautiful baby. But they're homeless. Bombing. Rebels. Do you know how expensive it would be to rebuild their homes like this? Do you know how expensive that would be? Huh? See this? That's massive. That's massive. Massive funerals. Right? How many people have been killed by your country, America? Huh? How many of your people have been killed by your country? Hmm? This is what your country has done for your people. Huh? See that? See? Nobody can live here. Bomb it. Yeah. See these people? They're homeless. Their homes have been bombed to the ground by your country. Now they are living in tents. Right? See this? Huh? See how they leave. Huh? See this picture. I've seen this picture before, but today when I saw it, actually a few hours ago, I was crying so loud. 
I couldn't hold myself. I cried loud. This is what your country, America, has done for your people. Hmm? Do we need to look at more pictures? Huh? There are literally thousands of pictures like this on the internet. Do I have to show you more? Huh? Do I have to show you more about what your country has done for your people? Hmm? And you call America your country? <sighs> I don't know what is more ridiculous than this. <sighs> but when I was saying there was nothing more ridiculous than she called America her country. But then she surprised me one more time and listen again to her. The men always say that they had so much faith and trust in the United States government, but uh, it turned out to be that was not what they expected and they were disappointed. I was too. I was disappointed in a legal system in the U.S. and the, um, the constitution we have in this great country, um, how our forefathers built this country on, based on what values. What happened in Guantanamo was not what I understood of the constitution. This is a book published by the U.S. government. It's called the outline of U.S. history. It's free. Anybody can uh, search for it online and read it. Totally free. Right? This is in the PDF format. It's not easy to edit, so I made it in the Microsoft Word format for it to be more editable. And now, let's take a look at what the forefathers did during the time of American independence, right? Back then, the America, uh, the US, uh, not the US yet, right? America was, uh, the colonists was too weak to fight for themselves. Right? So, America sent Benjamin Franklin to Paris in 1776. Take a look at here. Right? His wit, guile, and intellect soon made their presence felt in the French capital and played a major role in winning French assistance. Benjamin Franklin was one of the forefathers. This here means France didn't ask to help. It was America who asked France for help. Because what? Because of uh, France and the UK were enemies forever. But that's all right, right? So France came and helped, right? Helped. And uh, take a look here. France began providing aid to the colonists in May 1776, when it sent 14 ships with war supplies to America. But here, pay attention. Huh? In fact, most of the gunpowder used by the American armies came from France. See how important France, a uh, French assistance was, right? But later here, let's take a look here. 
they signed a treaty, right? Oh, uh, here, right. This is the on um, February. Uh, this is the time you have to remember. This is a time very important time. Uh, 1778. They first signed this uh, commerce uh, treaty, but that's uh, uh, the commerce, right? But here is the more important one. They also signed a treaty of allies, which stipulated that if France entered the war, neither country would lay down its arms until the colonists won their independence that neither would conclude peace with Britain without the content, con without the consent of the other, and that each guaranteed the other's possessions in America. This is very important. But later, let's take a look later what the forefathers did. All right, here. In 1793, France had a trouble. Had a trouble with Britain, Spain, and Holland. All of them three were in war against France. So according to the Franco-American Treaty of Alliance of 1778, the United States and France were perpetual allies, right? And the United States were was obliged to help France defend the West Indies. <laughs> Let's take a look at what a, here, right? What happened here? On um, April 22nd, 1793, Washington, Washington, George Washington, the first president of America, actually the chief of the forefathers, right? Effectively abrogated the terms of the 17. 78 treaty that had made American independence possible. Here, George Washington, chief of the forefathers, refused to help a friend. When America needed help, the friend came and helped. But when the friend was in trouble, the forefathers refused to help. Funny, huh? This means the forefathers, the so-called forefathers by Roshan, were only oath breakers, were betrayers, and it was these people that Roshan called forefathers. Oh my God. Oh, oh, oh my God. This, this Roshan woman, just no shame at all. This Roshan woman is so ignorant that she didn't know about the American history. And she called America her country, and she called the so-called forefathers, forefathers, our forefathers, she said. Oh, my God. Well, let's come back to Xinjiang country. Now, the Western countries accuse China of forcing Uyghur Muslims to pick cotton. That's totally not true. No forced labors whatsoever. But it doesn't sound familiar. The Western countries accuse others of 
doing things the others didn't do. That sounds familiar. Uh, let me show you why it is familiar. We look back now at a largely forgotten aspect of Bush's war in Iraq, the vast domestic propaganda campaign that occurred in the United States before the invasion began. The story centers on a young Kuwaiti woman named Nayira. On October 10, 1990, the 15-year-old girl gave riveting testimony before Congress about the horrors inside Kuwait after Iraq invaded. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Nayira, and I just came out of Kuwait. My sister, with my five-day-old nephew, traveled across the desert to safety. There was no milk available for the baby in Kuwait. They barely escaped when their car was stuck in the desert, desert sand, and help came from Saudi Arabia. I stayed behind and wanted to do something for my country. The second week after the invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the al Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. It was horrifying. I could not help but think of my nephew. Nayira's testimony was rebroadcast across the country and marked a turning point in public opinion on going to war. President George H.W. Bush repeatedly cited her claims. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Three months after Nayira testified, President George H.W. Bush launched the invasion of Iraq. But it turned out Nayira's claims weren't true. No human rights group or news outlet could confirm what she said. It also turned out Nayira was not just any Kuwaiti teenager. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, Saad Nasir al-Sabah. She had been coached by the public relations firm Hill & Knowlton, which was working for the Kuwaiti government. After the war, it's not just me, it's John Martin uh, who did the, the really good reporting. He went around to for all ABC. the hospitals for ABC News and did what a reporter should do, unfortunately too late, interviewed <laughs> hospital personnel, doctors, did a very thorough job. Nobody could cite one instance of a baby being pulled from an incubator by uh, Iraqi soldiers and killed. Uh, there were babies killed because of neglect and because of the American bombardment uh, uh, of Kuwait and of Iraq, uh, because a lot of hospital personnel fled. There were casualties. There were infants uh, who died. But there were no uh, babies killed by being pulled from incubators. It never happened. You see why it is familiar? Huh? The girl, 15-year-old girl, lied. She delivered false testimony. She was coached by others to deliver false testimony. And then the U.S. used her testimony to launch war against Iraq. Tens of thousands of civilians were killed. Iraq and the Kuwait were turned to rebels. That's what the U.S. does. That's what a kind of country the United States of America is. That's the country Roshan calls her country. <laughs> That's just the beginning. Right? And let's see later what the U.S. did again to launch another war. 
Uh, but a lot of people counted on you. I know. You changed the ball. I changed. I changed. I turned the dial. There's no yeah, question about it. And that's what the president wanted me to do and what I was supposed to do. You regret it. I regret it now because the information is wrong. Of course I do. But I will always be seen as the one who made the case before the international community. That was uh, Colin Powell. He was talking in a, a TV show about the war the U.S. launched in 2003 based on the powder, a vial of white powder he showed in front of the uh, United Nations. He said it was uh, anthrax. So, and uh, something else, the, the weapon of uh, mass destruction. And they all lied. And they used the lies to launch another war against Iraq. And we all know what happened after that. The country <sighs> has been in hell since then. The leader of the country was executed by the United States of America. They destroyed a country based on lies. And they are now, they got away from it. <laughs> Millions of people killed. The country was destroyed. The leader was executed. And all those people the country were Russians people. The country was Russians people's homeland. Destroyed by the so-called Russians country. Her country. <laughs> oh my God. It's like a a hooker who has a sugar daddy. The sugar daddy gives her a lot of money to spend and to sleep with her anytime he wants. And meanwhile, the sugar daddy is killing her family. And that's what a Russia is. Shameless. But Roshan, just I, this this kind of people like like her. Just you cannot understand them because they 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 are not human. And furthermore. The, and she even may, makes up more stuff to smear China. Let's take a listen. So um, China is basically right now um, being the totalitarian uh, regime. Everybody knows what China is doing to the Uyghurs, to the Tibetans, to the Southern Mongolians. Now she wants to drag Tibetans and Mongolians into this. Of course, she's lying. You take a look on, on uh, internet, YouTube, right? Let's let's take a look. Let's take a look together, right? But you go to the YouTube and you search for things about Tibet. Let's say. Uh, traveling Tibet, right? Let's search. You see, there are a lot of uh, 
videos posted by individuals. Of course, there are videos posted by the government, the Chinese government, but most of the videos are by uh, in by by individual YouTubers like this girl. Now she's a foreigner, right? She's a foreigner, and uh, I think uh, this girl is also a foreigner. There are many foreigners. I think this this is also a foreigner, and there are foreigners too. Oh, oh there are foreigners too. Actually, there are also the biased people. They came to China to find something bad about the Communist Party, but they, they cannot find any. So they are just bad mouthing. They are bad mouthing the Chinese government or the Communist Party, <laughs> like this couple. Right? But let's take a look at this girl's video. Right? <laughs> Streets right now. So, this is the first bridge bound play, and they are just doing a play here. So, you need to hold now. You see this, right? You see the people they are happy and they worship freely. And that's the point, right? If you, that's the freedom of, of religion. If you just worship something just peacefully, nobody will bother you. Just don't go around and kill people. They blow things up. Just don't do that, right? And you, you do those things and you, you, you are arrested and you call it it's, it's suppressing freedom of religion. Huh? That's crazy, right? So this is Tibet, and actually you can search yourself Tibet about uh, the daily lives of Tibet, Tibetan people. Right? You can see they are really happy. There's nothing uh, uh, called the suppression. No, those are lies uh, made by uh, the Uyghur activists like. Uh, like a uh, Russian, right? They're liars. Hmm? Here, let's take a look at what is going on in Xinjiang now, right? Let's use this Xinjiang food to take a look. You see, the same as Tibet. All this, most of this uh, videos were posted by individual YouTubers. You see this guy, he's a foreigner, right? And many others, they are foreigners too. I mean, some are Chinese, they are travelers, right? This, this guy is also a foreigner. Again, oh, and this, this one is posted, was posted by the Chinese government. That's fine, forget about that, right? And others, you just take a look. You click into them, and of them. Take a look at the people's faces, how happy they are. You can see how peaceful they are living their lives. There is no suppression. Can you see? Because they are not, uh, this, these videos are not political not political, right? You can see between the lines how happy they are. Do they look like being suppressed? No. When you look at this, your the lies of this Russian person and some other crazy activists will be debunked automatically, right? So just, just take a look yourself. You can take a look yourself. Get on YouTube and 
search for Xinjiang food or you know, travel traveling in Xinjiang, whatever, right? Just take a look. How hard that would be, right? That's the easiest thing you can do to debunk the lies of the activists. Just, just do that to, to see the lies of them. This Roshan, she claims that the Chinese government is committing genocide of the Uyghurs. But let's take a look at what she says when Daniel Dumbrio asks her for evidence. Videos so like do, you, do, do you see, though, do you see the, the dilemma here, though, that uh, for my never again, having you coming here and saying, or, or all these other people saying that there's a massive genocide going on, there's three million people being incarcerated, but we don't have evidence. Do you see that that is really problematic with my no, never no, no, again? That do, I'm, I, know, I am not saying we don't have evidence. Chinese government is destroying the evidence, but we have people. We have people are talking the witnesses and we have 600 pages of Chinese leaked documents. And just because, you know, if you read Chinese, you know, maybe your wife can read that for you. The 600 pages of Chinese leaked documents says exactly what you said. They said, um, West will cry out, West will say human rights abuse this and that, but don't, you know, don't uh, distract it by that. Keep doing what you are doing because they knew someday people like you will come and defend and they say, show me your evidence. You, know? <laughs> you hear that, right? She said she had had evidence, but she cannot show you because the Chinese government destroyed the evidence. <laughs> That's her excuse, not showing the evidence. Right? She said she had some 600 pages of leaked government documents. Does that sound familiar? Indeed. Let me show you why. We keep hearing the drumbeat of where is the evidence? Right here, Sean. 234 pages of sworn affidavits. These are real people, real allegations, signed with notaries who are alleging the following, among other contentions. They are alleging this is one county, Wayne County, Michigan. They are saying that there was a batch of ballots where 60% had the same signature. They are saying that 35 ballots uh, had no voter record, but they were counted anyway. That 50 ballots were run multiple times through a tab machine uh, that one woman said her son was deceased but nevertheless somehow voted uh, these are one of many many allegations in one county in a county no less where a poll watchers were in many cases threatened with racial harassment uh, they were pushed out of the way and Democrat challengers were handing out documents how to distract GOP challengers these are real and anyone who cares about transparency and the integrity of the system should want this to pursue to the discovery phase <laughs> we all know what that, how that turned out, right? She was the secretary of press of the former president, uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump claimed that the election was rigged. His lawyers filed over 60 lawsuits in the state's courts and the Supreme Court. But all of them, all the lawsuits were denied or dismissed. Actually, there was one that was uh, the verdict was uh, in favor of him, but later it was overturned. So that means all the lawsuits filed by Donald Trump were denied or dismissed. And his secretary of, of press showed the 200 some pages of affidavits, right? <laughs> That's why it sounds familiar. I Russians claimed um, a few hundreds of stuff. Sound familiar with this, right? They're all liars. Right? Donald Trump and uh, his uh, secretary of press are all liars, 
just like Roshan herself. Liars. This, this, these people are they're shameless liars. They said something not exist. That's it. I mean, they are just habitual liars. You cannot reason with them. That's what they are. Yes, liars are like that. They don't have evidence, and they want you to believe with them. Uh, they just they, they are the brain. Their brains, the, some they're short of. They're missing some parts. Their brains. They they don't come back around. Think about their logic. They don't do that. Let me ask this uh, Roshan, this liar. If you say you have evidence, but you don't show people, you want people to believe you. What if I say you are a murderer? You murder somebody. I don't have any evidence. And I want people to believe me. And so you are a murderer. And you will be sentenced to death or life. If you are sentenced to death, you will be executed right now. You think that's fair? Do you think that's fair? You shameless liar. No evidence and you want people to believe you? The Supreme Court of the United States of America dismissed all the Donald Trump cases for lack of evidence. Even the justice appointed by himself dismissed the cases. And you want people to believe you, the stupid, the crazy claims, the loony toony claims, when you don't have evidence. You, you have brought shame. You have brought embarrassment to the whole Muslim community. You should be ashamed of yourself. Or are you? Because you are unable to be ashamed. You have no shame. You are shameless. And there's another activist. He he said he's uh, in Australia. Now, let me show you the face of him. And that's him. This guy, this liar. And all his tweets are about some, just some claims. No evidence. And he downloaded something like this, right? And he says some forced labor, you know, just, I mean, all mothers do this. My mother did this too, right? Because there's a little child, where are you going to put her or him, right? Just take care of him or her you know, while you're working. Many moms do that. And uh, there, there is another uh, picture you see here, a video. So this little girl is picking uh, cotton. I did this too, because I, you know, my mom, uh, you know, just did this uh, so I could help, you know, whatever I could do, right? Just you do something is better than nothing, right? Or just, you know, the, the kids, they just do something. Just like that. And uh, he posted this video here and uh, saying some slave labor. You see? And Daniel Dumbrell, he talked about this a lot. So I, I don't have to repeat it here. You can 
watch his videos about this, right? All, all lies, actually, all lies. This guy and the Russian woman are all liars. And he said he's in Australia. But let's let's see what Australia, Australian uh, special forces did in Afghanistan. Let's take a look. Australia's elite troops raid an Afghan village. It's 2012, the height of the West War on the Taliban. A young man is captured. He seems to be unarmed. Do you want me to kill him? The soldier shouts at his commander. Quick, no! Quick! There are shots. The prisoner is dead. Nor was this a one-off. Soldiers sent to liberate accused instead of cold-blooded murder. Shameful is the verdict of Australia's army chief. To the people of Afghanistan, on behalf of the Australian Defence Force, I sincerely and unreservedly apologise. The inquiry condemns Australia's SAS for a so-called warrior culture, with young soldiers ordered to shoot prisoners as a first kill a practice known as blooding. The report calls it all possibly the most disgraceful episode in Australia's military history. 39 Afghans were unlawfully killed by 25 soldiers, overwhelmingly from the SAS. 19, the report says, should face criminal investigation. The killing, the unlawful killing of civilians and prisoners is never acceptable. Australia's SAS bears the same name, boasts the same who dares wins motto, and is modelled upon Britain's own special forces, which has faced similar allegations. There's been an inquiry here, but no one will face prosecution. We lost this war, and one of the reasons for that is that the message we were giving to Afghan people, which is we're here to protect you, was being totally undermined by people who would raid houses in the middle of the night and murder people who were not involved in any form of terrorism or insurgent activity. The UK government is changing the law to make it harder to prosecute soldiers for alleged war crimes. In Australia, the disgraced SAS unit is to be disbanded. John Ray, News at 10. This is a, this is a person called uh, Arslan. You see what the Australian Special Forces did to your people, and you, you say nothing. And while you are claiming that China is committing a genocide, and that's not true, you see what kind of person you are, you and a Russian. People like you are liars. You have brought shame to the Muslim community. The next video shows how evil the United States of America is. And it's about a U.S. military official talking about China and the Uyghurs. Take a look. We're in Afghanistan as we were in Germany post-World War II because it is the only hard power the United States has that sits proximate to the Central Base Road Initiative of China that runs across Central Asia. If we had to impact that with military power, we are in position to do so in Afghanistan. Second reason we're there is because we're cheek and jowl with the potentially most unstable nuclear stockpile on the face of the earth in Pakistan. We want to be able to leap on that stockpile and stabilize it if necessary. And the third reason we're there is because there are 20 million Uyghurs. And if the CIA has to mount an operation using those Uyghurs, as Erdogan has done in Turkey against Assad, there are 20,000 of them in Idlib, in Idlib in Syria right now. Well, the CIA would want to destabilize China, and that would be the best way to do it, to foment unrest and to join with those Uyghurs in pushing the Han Chinese and Beijing from internal places rather than external.
We all see that, right? The U.S. wants to use the Uyghurs to destabilize China. Have you woken up yet, Uyghurs? They want to use you to destabilize China. And the few crazy Uyghur activists just so willingly to be used. On the one hand, they are killing our people in the Middle East. And on the other hand, they are, they are using you to destabilize another country. You, know, you, you cannot see what is going on here? What is wrong with you? It's not too late to turn back. If you keep doing this, in the end, you will pay for your craziness. You will pay for your crimes.